check one, two. What's up, guys? I am making this video on a day where my kids are doing virtual learning. So there's two virtual learning students in my small apartment. So um, you're not gonna see much of my face and you might hear some strange sounds. So I'm gonna make this more like a slideshow video where I narrate what we're talking about. We're gonna explore one of your rabbit trail questions. I've got them right here. Okay, I know it was in here because I read it and prepared a lesson for it, but I can't find the question. Anyway, this whole project, I hope you guys have had fun. This is our last session in Chasing Rabbits. And the question you asked, if I remember it correctly, I wrote it down. How old is the Bible? I feel like I should know. Now, I want to get into this because the Bible is actually a composite document. 66 books written across millennia. So let's dive into that incredible question. We're gonna get into something we call textual criticism. Uh, this is looking, yep, my, my kids are home. So I'm gonna make the rest of this video like a slideshow and I'll narrate it. It'll be a little easier for me to find space because um, this desk I'm using right now is one of the uh, virtual learning stations in my house, so okay. Uh, let's get into it. You guys ready? Let's go down the rabbit hole about the age and the composition of scripture. How did we get the Bible? I, I found a, a quiet corner, believe it or not, somehow, by the grace of God, so you can see my face a little bit more. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. All right. So how did we get this thing we hold? Many of us are holding, I would think, English translations for our audience here. And this didn't plop out of God's mouth in King James English. <laughs> Contrary to unfortunately popular belief, what you're holding is 66 independent books that were written over millennia and have been collected throughout those millennia as the inspired word of God, that God actually worked through these stories, these different genres, poetry, prophecy, letters, that he's been telling a cohesive story throughout this amazing epic that spans human history. So uh, how old is the Bible? Let's, let's get to that, but let's just talk about the manuscript evidence first. <clears throat> Let me put it this way. We don't have the autographs. It's a fancy word for the very first document that say Moses wrote or Jeremiah wrote. We don't have those original pieces of paper or stone or whatever they were writing on, papyrus, vellum, all of these things. We do have copies of those. And so what we're looking at here is the Masoretic texts, which were uh, a textual tradition of scribes who painstakingly copied um, the manuscripts and preserved them for generations, the pronunciations of the text. There are silver amulets. We have scripture written on silver and different pieces of jewelry. We have the Qumran manuscripts. We're going to talk in a minute about the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, which are an, an amazing discovery. There's the Samaritan Pentateuch, so now we're getting into different languages or translations um, that would have been uh, contemporaneous with uh, Jesus' day, for example, for the Old Testament. Samaritan Pentateuch, um, Septuagint, and then there's there's translations of Old Testament texts in Syriac, Old Latin, Boharic, Ethiopic. Um, so just really all across the globe here, we've got a lot of places to draw from in order to to uh, bear witness to the text. These are manuscripts that um, this field called textual criticism uh, scholars can come together and compare these texts and see where uh, perhaps there's a, a an editorial or a copyist mistake. And uh, what's really fascinating about this, maybe maybe it unnerves you. Um, to think about them, the copied text actually containing a few spelling errors or something like that. If that if that bothers you, uh, there's a really uh, interesting field called textual criticism, and what it essentially does, it establishes how <laughs> insignificant those little variants are in all of those manuscripts. So let me read here from Paul Wegner, 
Still, there are relatively few significant variants in the Bible. And among these variants, there is very little difference in meaning and content. To help put this into perspective, it is commonly said that no theological doctrine or issue hinges on a textual variant, and that there are more differences between them than various English translations of the New Testament than there among the Greek manuscripts. So, yeah, just give you a lot of confidence in what you're reading would have been pretty much what the people who wrote it said. And again, there may be a handful of spelling errors along the way, things like that. If you're interested in that, uh, let's talk about those specific errors. errors. Um, But yeah, uh, what you're reading has been very well preserved for millennia. As we move to the New Testament, witnesses, uh, aka what documents, these scraps of papyrus, these scraps of um, uh, codices, which are like early books. Um, we have all these, again, we don't actually have the letter that Paul put in the mail to to Rome for the book of Romans, for example. We don't have the, what's called autographs, but we have copies. And, and some of these copies are very early. They would have, they would have been, you know, uh, uh, not not that far removed from the original document in terms of its timestamp. So we have papyri, we have unseals, which are um, like uh, it's it's when they wrote like all the words like right together. And they have cursives and Byzantine lectionaries. So um, we have these texts that were preserved and gathered by early church people in the East. We have versions, right? We have um, different different c- compilations of, of the scriptures in the New Testament. And we actually have a lot of quotations from um, writings by early church fathers. So there's a lot of places to pull in. What did the original piece of paper that Paul put in the mail, so to speak, uh, his papyri, his scroll, he rolled up to say Romans, what did it actually say? Well, no, we don't have that piece of mail. <laughs> we don't have uh, Luke's original uh, letters to Theophilus, but we have copies, and those copies are very reliable because they come from very early on, and all of these uh, these sources can testify the reliability of these things. So let me put it this way. Uh, again, go, going back to Paul Wegner, the modern Greek critical editions are a collection of the best readings from each of the approximately check this out 5487 manuscripts this is talking about the new testament and other witnesses to the greek text this is called an eclectic text whereas diplomatic edition is primarily a text from one manuscript like say the old testament texts are based predominantly out of the mesoretic text as and then they're diplomatically edited based on um other versions that they found. So um, this field is incredibly complex. The people that study textual criticism spend their lives learning all these different uh, languages. Many of them are no longer spoken. And just to be able to to affirm that the scrap of, of you know, papyrus or this this thing written on a piece of silver in Paleo-Hebrew or, or whatever it is, that, that they're, they're, they're testifying to the validity, the earliness the reliability and the stability of the text that we're reading that we have that's been translated for us. So the text behind the text that we're reading, um, no, it did. we don't have the original stone tablets, we don't have the original papyrus letters, but we have so many witnesses, so many pieces of copies of these things that all collaborate to show that for the most part, we believe that the scriptures we have are the message that God intended to convey to the very original audience. And short of some spelling errors and a few uh, things of that nature, um, we we uh, get to, to enjoy the revelation of God as he revealed himself to the original audience. Now, I do want to say that our doctrine of scripture, our belief in the the word of God, if you will, uh, is also an encounter with the humanity through which God revealed it. Something about our doctrine of scripture has to be incarnational. What do I mean by this? I'm, I'm speaking densely here. Just like Jesus became human, God in flesh became human to redeem us. And he was every bit human. God's revelation of himself is every bit human too. That people, that he would allow people to make 
spelling errors along the way uh, that, that, that some of these copies and manuscripts if we had the stone tablets if we had Paul's letter uh, I think there's something about the wisdom of God here that maybe we would make an idol out of those things but we can believe that the message because of all of this this textual evidence throughout archaeological discoveries as we'll talk about in a moment and throughout history uh, and these scholars that have have uh, really for generations and generations and generations collaborated to say yeah this is what the message said this is what paul wrote this is what jeremiah wrote this is what abraham uh spoke about and what moses recorded um okay so just enjoy the text you're reading appreciate it with a new depth realizing that many 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 hands of people faithfully believing that these words they held and copied were were from god a message god wanted to convey have touched your text and you get to appreciate a little bit more the pages you hold in your hand when you pick up your translation of this 66 book amazing document we call the holy scriptures the process uh, of writing so the original question posed in this although i can't find that sticky note is something about the age of the bible i mean you're talking about all the way back in abraham's era right so like what bronze age it's like 2000s or something like that a lot of the and then obviously he's talking about uh oral history was abraham writing this stuff down or not and did adam write this down well what we know about let's say the earliest books of the bible the pentateuch tradition holds that moses compiled not only the oral traditions of his people that it was passed orally just like a a good story is passed generation to generation to generation you don't necessarily need to write it down you tell it um there's a belief that that the scriptures kind of changed in terms of their their format from oral tradition to written as as the the era of moses and as god gave all of these explicit instructions and the legal code etc etc so you're talking about what is that the 15th century so uh uh, BC. Yeah, who knows how old some of these books are. Uh, Job is one of those that are really hard to date. Um, it might even be pre, pre-Moses, pre right? So we're talking about maybe, uh, what is the, uh, what is that movie? What's that movie? A tale as old as time. I don't think it's Beauty and the Beast, guys. I think it's the scriptures we're holding. So the oral traditions um, of, of ancient pre-literate Israel being preserved during an era of, of literacy, at least limited literacy, um, with the era of Moses. And then um, uh, the canon, um, a lot of the books uh, um, get composed and compiled and collected around the time of the Babylonian exile. And then uh, from there on, um, you, you get even translations of the Old Testament into, say, Greek. Um, and for the New Testament, all of those books were written like within the lifetime of the generation around Jesus, right? So, uh, yeah, within within that generation of people who saw and witnessed Jesus, all of those texts are accredited to people who you know, spent time with him. So, yeah, you've got the apostolic authorship question mark, right, of all of these uh, texts like Paul encountered Jesus. We got the apostles or associates of apostles like Mark's gospel. Mark not listed as an apostle, but he's allegedly recording Peter's account. Um, you have Luke, who's again not an apostle, but um, he, as a as a journalist, um, kind of recording um, the account a, 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 um, as as an associate of Paul. So we have all of these texts that would have been written early, a part of the first century into the later part of the, the first century. Yes, we have a collection of texts, 66 canonized texts in the Old and New Testament, what we call the Holy Bible, that would have been written across um, an amazing span of history, the unfolding revelation of God. And it's kind of exciting stuff, don't you think? And so one of the things, if you want to do book by book, one of the great questions we can ask when we're getting to a text is, when was this written from whom to whom and why 
And so all of those key questions kind of help us um, acquaint ourselves with the challenges and the uh, beautiful insights gained through appreciating how a text arrived to us. And it helps us perhaps situate ourselves in a way uh, much like perhaps as best we can do um, to reconstruct the original audience and to appreciate the unfolding of God's revelation in the time and place and among the people that it originally happened that we might more clearly see today how those things could apply. So uh, let's move on. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I've mentioned this in, in, in passing. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, what, middle of the night of the 20th century? So uh, was it 47, 48, something like that? Um, there was a shepherd boy who, um, I, I think the story goes something like he threw a rock in a cave and heard something smash, so he checked it out. And sure enough, there was a bunch of, of very well-preserved, thanks to the climate and the, the storage, uh, uh, papyri and, 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 and texts that were, that were untouched since the first century. So during the time of Jesus some of these texts were and obviously a lot of them would have been old testament writings that um the jewish community um the essenes there's a bunch of jewish communities that live kind of in remote places that would have been copyists and so before this the oldest um copies of the the old uh old testament in entirety um were something like a thousand years uh newer so like uh, leningrad codex is one you have the tradition of the Masoretes who recorded and copied and copied and copied and copied these things painstakingly, uh, named after their ability to count the letters in the Old Testament and know exactly where they were. So they were that meticulous in their copying. But other than their good, uh, their good word and, and their and their excellent um, uh, copying, uh, how do we know that they preserved them if we don't have the originals? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, in large part validated their claims to have uh, copied well the text that they had available because the Dead Sea Scrolls, while there are some discrepancies and again some copyist issues and, 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 and in the field of textual criticism, it largely showed that the bulk of the text we have is absolutely reliably copied. And so uh, text from, uh, what, a thousand or a nine, 900 years or something like that previous to the earliest text we previously had are shown to be well copied, well preserved, not tampered with, not abused. These, these, uh, the faithfulness of people to copy what they felt like were the communications of God to people um, generation after generation. We must appreciate that as we look at something like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, so yeah, if you want to kind of look at what some of these look like, we have this papyri, these these early uh, scraps of of papyrus that would have been pressed into a paper and, and written on, and uh, yeah, this there's there's a whole field of this that people kind of um, take these fragments and kind of what am I reading here? If you could imagine your favorite story, like imagine a, 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 a you know Harry Potter um, and, and however many pages the say the last book is or whatever which one is biggest and you got like a um, a little scrap and um and it was handwritten and you're trying to figure out where this belongs and if it um this kind of fully appreciate what's going on in the field of textual criticism um, but largely again the field gives us a great deal of confidence that what we're reading is indeed what it claims to be that that these are these are preserved texts that have been copied and copied and copied that preserve the communication between God and people. It's it's quite remarkable. So how did they pick the books? If there's 66 of them, how did we get them bound? Or which ones uh, were decided against and which ones were decided for? And, and how did we get to what, you know, maybe you've looked around and, and noticed that the uh, Catholicism has a, a slightly different canon, what we call the apocryphal books, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there were other religious documents around the time of, of, of the comp compilation of these. So why did they pick what they picked? What, what, what is canon, uh, meaning what is the standard? What, is, what holds to be what we consider the word of God and what is outside of that canonicity? Maybe helpful to read, understand, original audience, uh, the apocryphal books, but why did, did they fall outside of the canon, so to speak? So I, I just want to address this with the Old Testament and then the New. This is from Arnold and Bayer. On certain occasions, Jewish leaders met to address this, speaking of canonicity, and other issues. One such meeting apparently occurred in 
Yamnia uh, toward the close of the first century AD. Scholars debate exactly what took place at Yamnia, but agreed the council did not determine which books belonged in the Old Testament. Rather, it appears to have confirmed books most had recognized for generations. In other words, the council may have endorsed certain books but really only confirmed the faith community's understanding. So what we see is a couple of events in history, Yamnia, we're gonna uh, talk about some conversations in, in the, the, the third century that, uh, that sealed, if you will, the canon for the New Testament. Um, what's interesting about this is, as this reports, these were already widely recognized, meaning these, these books, these texts, um, it seems as they were written were, were, were uh, understood to be uh, what they claim to be. I mean, if you could imagine um, someone just claiming, hey, I heard from God something, and they just plopped a, a text on you, um, we'd be a little skeptical, right? Um, but as it seems, it seems like the, the validity of these texts had been preserved and, and, and then formally acknowledged, even though it seemed that it had widely been acknowledged for the Old Testament uh, here in, in uh, 90 AD or so. All right, what about the New Testament? Um, the canon... Uh, so let's go to Alistair McGrath. The canon was not a list of authorized documents imposed on a church, but a formalization of the authority and utility of those documents that already enjoyed universal usage and approbation throughout the Christian world. <clears throat> a widespread consensus appears to have emerged within churches by the middle of the third century over the core elements of what we now call the New Testament. This consensus was not imposed on Christian communities. Indeed, where centralized decisions were made, these are best seen as the endorsement of an existing practice or consensus. So, uh, what are we getting at here? Oh, we got a new letter from Paul a hundred years late. Uh, that That just didn't that just didn't happen. Uh, the, 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 the validity of these texts and the, the copies of the texts as they were preserved uh, for those first few generations were acknowledged um, uh, as, as they came. Even though you can read some things about when the canon was quote unquote decided, it wasn't really decided. It was just acknowledged that these letters were the ones in circulation that they had received from that apostolic generation, that generation that was alive during the time of Jesus uh, who bore witness to him and uh, proclaim the truth of the good news. So guys, I know that's a lot of things. Um, and while the question uh, centered on when uh, or how old is the Bible, um, I, I hope this helps you understand that that even in and of itself is a bit of a, a stretched out question because God has been revealing himself since the beginning. And as we have collected and as the people of faith have acknowledged God's work in these texts and his message, and they have copied it and they've copied it and they've canonized it and they've acknowledged, hey, this is what God's been up to. We can believe that this incredible, incredible uh, narrative that's been unfolding with scripture, we can approach it with a renewed sense of awe, a renewed sense of its humanity, that God has partnered so much with humanity that he has enabled his very message about who he is to be in human hands. So guys, since the beginning, God has wanted to partner with humanity to share his character and to share his story. And the Bible is a testimony to that amazing intent of God. And he's living it out today as we read, as we encounter the scriptures, and as we live out the story in those hallowed pages. God's message is alive and active, and it is working through our obedience to the text and, our, and the transformation of our lives as we encounter God's self-revelatory aims, and we become transformed as we start to understand that the shape of this story that has been so well preserved is indeed the shape of our story. So may we continue to be redeemed and rescued by God's partnership. All right, I hope this has been fun. Godspeed. All right, guys, let me add this in here for the mix. I want to show you a couple of recommended resources if this topic has really interested you. There's a lot of really great and quite thorough resources out there just at a click of a button. So I'm going to include them in the description in the video. So if you want to check out those links and any angle that you're really kind of wrestling with as you think about the biblical text, uh, there's a there's some really good scholarship and some wonderful believers who have helped us understand 
and how to see these things. So check it out below. Guys, I hope you had a wonderful time going down these rabbit holes. And just know that God and faith and the scriptures and all of the things that we we have, you know, this is a, a faith. Uh, one of my uh, professors, New Testament professors put it this way, that Christianity is not a faith of transaction, but a faith of struggle. I think about the namesake Israel, Israel, Jacob. Jacob got his name, you know, look at uh, Genesis and, and, and this weird story of Jacob wrestling what seems to be an angel, and then he gets a blessing over it, and he refused to let go. And so maybe your faith feels like a struggle sometimes, like a wrestling match, but don't let go. Don't let go. Tough questions actually sometimes allow us to receive blessing we would have never had if we haven't gone through that struggle. And so just let your faith grow as you struggle, and and don't see struggling as a weakness in your faith, but actually a means to a deeper and a stronger faith. So thanks for joining me on this adventure, and I hope it's been edifying. It has been for me, and uh, we'll see you for our next adventure. Godspeed.